see here. If I can make sure I can turn here and see everybody here. <laughs> this will be our 63rd lesson tonight in Ephesians. We're going to be in verses 9 and 10. <laughs> now, any dis discussion and perusal of the kingdom of God the kingdom of God by definition is his working and his wisdom made known in what he's he's doing something special in this day of salvation he's working salvation in the midst of the earth in God's kingdom to us it's so associated with the, this salvation working it out He's associated and involves thought on our part. Thought, reason, logic, cognition, which has to do with being able to see it clearly, and reaching conclusions. Now all of that is also involved in philosophy and philosophizing. But the kingdom of God is not a philosophical kingdom. It's not dealing with philosophical things. When we think about, talk about thinking and reasoning and concluding, this sort of thing, we're basing things upon reality, things that really are. And it's important to know that. This reality that exists in no way depends on humanity. Amen. There is not anything about salvation itself I'm not speaking now about the experience of salvation, just about salvation itself. The hand of man's not in it anywhere. Amen. Amen. Uh -huh. Man has had no participation in it whatsoever. Now the experiencing of it, that's that's where we be <laughs> we become involved there. But it's important to know this that Truth is settled reality. It can't be changed, and it existed before God ever created the world. All this, all this existed already. Everything particular that pertains to salvation. It existed in God's purpose, see? Yep. If God purposes it, I guess it's as good as done. So he purposed it before the world. Then when the world was created, it just was carried out. Now our thinking is based on those things that were purposed before the world began. Now this may seem kind of evident, but religious men have traditionally had a lot of difficulty comprehending this. So they have invented different approaches to religion. Religion meaning the outworking of your faith. It's what you do outwardly, that's your religion. It's a good word, the Bible uses the word. Pure religion, but if it's mere religion, well, that's, that's something else. Men, at any rate, they have, they have introduced a kind of religion that uses things like this. They, they base conclusions on inference. Now, of course, if you come from some the background I came from, you, you've heard a lot about inference. And it's just, it really didn't happen, but... Because it have we infer something from well, people have built theologies based on inference, which is purely human, or precedence. Something happened at, at point A, so that's what's always got to happen. So the day of Pentecost, everyone who received the Spirit spoke in tongues, so everybody who receives the Spirit speaks in tongues. See, that's based on precedence. And others even build a theology on silence. Because God didn't say something, that means something. There's a branch of the movement I was identified with that builds on this. The law of silence, they call it. I once said publicly that 
if there is such a law that silence teaches us, in that place in heaven where it says there was silence in heaven for space of half an hour, they probably have a set of commentaries on that <laughs> silence. <laughs> I'm saying this because these are approaches people have divided, made denominations, made sects, made basis of judging others based on what I would call philosophy, human philosophy. It is, it's, it's what people, they base it on what they think God meant. But it's got to be based on what God said. We read, we hear such phrases as the free will of man. See, that phrase isn't in the Bible, but you'd think it was in the Bible. Man's free moral agency. You see, you'd think that was in the Bible, but it isn't in the Bible. It's because that doesn't mean man doesn't have a will. Man does have a will, but out of Christ, it's not free. Amen. In Christ, it is. You know, you're, the will is freed when you're in Christ. And people talk about the plan of salvation. See, some of us heard that kind of jargon all our life, the plan of salvation, the Great Commission. And people judge you on whether you accept these terms, but they're not, they're human terms. They're not scriptural <coughs> terms. New Testament Christianity. There's people that view the whole, the whole, whole of Christendom, that'd be everyone that professes to be followers of Christ, and they group them, they group them by groups. Armenianism, that's people that believe in free will. The, there's Calvinism, that's people that uh, they say don't believe in free will. And there's premillennialism, that's that Jesus is going to come before the end of the world and a whole bunch of stuff's going to happen, he's going to come again. Then there's postmillennialism, that Jesus is going to come after a thousand year reign. Then there's Amillennial, which means everything is going to happen. Jesus, this is the kingdom right now. This is, this is the time when the everything's be, has been fulfilled already. And preterism, which means Jesus has already came. And anyway, these are these are terms that depict a whole body of doctrine, like like a doctrinal book that's used to form groups, condemn people accept people Amen. and they're all philosophical. Amen. Yeah. They're all based on what people think, Amen. not what God said. Amen. All right, now when we talk about the kingdom of God, none of that kind of stuff is in there. When Paul reasons, he doesn't reason with anything like this. This the Pharisees they did. Sadducees they did, scribes they did, the lawyers they did. But when Jesus came, this isn't the way he thought at all. He not nothing just scrapping whole bodies of whole bodies of theology. He'd just scrap it. Amen. He'd say you don't know anything at all. You know. Now it's important to deal with a text like we're dealing with. It's important to know this. These things. Again. Sound doctrine is based on specific statements that were made by the, by the prophets, Jesus Christ himself, and the apostles. These, were de these had like for the first time revelations. Other people had their eyes opened to understand what, what they had, these had said. But it's what they said, that's the, that's the thing that sound doctrine is based upon, what they said. Now Paul is dealing with this, with this kind of thing in our text. He actually is going about to deliver men from vain tradition. Now it's, it's, it's stated in scripture that Jesus delivered us from vain traditions. That is, these philosophical views to which many of us were once enslaved. Once enslaved. Here's what Peter said. We, he has delivered us. This, I believe it's 2 Peter 1.18. He delivered us from the traditions, vain traditions received. He delivered us from vanity that we received by the traditions from our fathers. 
It was handed down. Jesus delivered us. Now, if you've ever experienced this, and I have, I've experienced this. I was actually enslaved to a religious system. I, did, I didn't know I was, but I thought in the, inside a, a box that man had built. <laughs> That's what happened. Yes. Now, Jesus delivered us, and you can walk out of that just as surely as Israel walked out of Egypt. You can just get up. Oh, it's liberating, brethren. It is liberating. You can walk. All of a sudden, you find out you have more brothers than you thought you had, more brothers and sisters than you thought you had, because you were looking at their label before. Now, our text <coughs> reveals that Paul is getting people ready so they'll pass the, the judgment, pass the day of judgment. That's he's getting them ready so that'll happen. And he's said a number of things already, as you know. He's warned us, don't let anyone deceive you with vain words. If sin's in the camp, wrath's on the way. Don't, don't, let, don't, don't let anybody deceive you about this. Uh -huh. Sin's in the camp, say, oh, well, we gotta... We got to try and help these people as much as we can. Well, I know that sounds real nice, but that's that's not what he says. He says, "Don't let this stuff be named not one time among you. Make sure it's not there. You make sure it's not in your assembly. Make sure it's not there. And if you it's there like Corinth was, get it out. Amen. Get it out. So here's what he is. Here's what he says, verse nine and ten. For the fruit of the spirit." <coughs> is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable to the Lord. Mm, boy, that's a good day. <laughs> now, you notice that verse 9 is a, a parenthetical statement, kind of explanatory, where of walk as children of light. So he knows some people may not know what that means. So this parenthetical statement, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Just to let you know that walking as children of light involves goodness and righteousness and truth. Now let's take a look at this uh, verse 4. <clears throat> Other versions say because. Are they, this, is a, this is an extension of the thought expressed in verse 7. Be ye not therefore partakers with them. See, he's, he's, delay, he's elaborating on this. On why there's some things you, you, you just can't do. And that's all there is to it. Can't mean, not meaning impossible. Can't meaning God won't allow it. He's expressing, he's extending this thought. Now this is, we've emphasized this quite a bit in, in this uh, book of Ephesians that you've got to learn to think long thoughts. <laughs> you've got to learn how to think in little little choppy thoughts. Now the world teaches us to read little choppy sentences, write little choppy sentences. Huh? Well, yeah, this is taught now. Amen. Speak any little choppy sentences, thinking that makes it plain. But actually, that compounds the problem. You want to learn to think in extended thought. Why? Because in the kingdom of God, everything's related. Amen. See, it's all connected. So in language, that's why we have colons and semicolons and commas and dash, M dashes, that long dash. That's why we have that, see? Because of extended thought. So this, uh, what he's going to tell us is Newness of life, it has a certain trait about it. And you've got to, that's why he's going to throw this in. It, in newness of life, there's more involved in what you don't do. Right? There's more involved in not doing some things. There's some things that are. And then furthermore, what's done has certain qualities about it. So he's going to expound on that. That means, if this is true, that means it's totally unreasonable for anyone in Christ to live in a worldly manner. Amen. It can't be explained. There, there's no explanatory sentences about this, uh, that God may allow a person to do this, or uh, this may be all right, it's, as long as you don't go too far, and all that. 
There's no allowance made for this, for living in a worldly manner. Life must be conducted in keeping with new creatureship. Uh, Galatians uh, 6, 14 talks about in Christ neither circumcision availeth nor in uncircumcision but the new creature. And then the next verse says, that was 15, I think 16 says, and let us walk by the same rule. What's the rule? New creatureship. <laughs> That's the means of measuring. New creatureship. Now we're going to see that the, the Holy Spirit, if he's not quenched, if he's not grieved, if he's not resisted, there's certain things he produces. That's what we're going to see here. If, the, if these things aren't found, the Holy Spirit's not there. Because you don't have any such thing as a non-working Holy Spirit. Yeah, amen. <laughs> An idle Holy Spirit. There's no such thing as this. Amen. See, if you quench the Spirit, you don't allow Him to work, He leaves. Amen. He, doesn't go to, he doesn't go to sleep. Mm -hmm. He doesn't go in the back room and rest. He leaves. Yeah. And a person who's dead like this, like Saul and Samson, they don't know he left. Mm -hmm. yeah. At all. The fruit, for the fruit, the fruit, it's a good word. Some versions say the effects. Williams Bible says the product. The contemporary English version, as usual, completely botches the verse up. It says, make your light shine. I mean... Someone ought to burn those up. Right. Make your light shine. That's what I'll read it. Make your light shine. Good speech says leads to. As if the, this is what the Spirit's work leads to, what follows. And the message Bible says actions. Now the word fruit, if you want to get down to like a dictionary definition of it, it means that which originates or comes from something in effect, a result, a work, a act, or a deed. Now a new child, for instance, is the fruit of your body. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it's called in the scripture. Yeah. Or the fruit of your loins. That was Abraham's offspring. That was fruit. Praise to God is the fruit of our lips. Yeah. Something comes comes from something. Fruit comes from something that's alive. Of course, you can't have a living thing come from a dead thing. The Lord Jesus summed it up in this way. Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every fruit, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Then another place it says, you'll know a fruit, you'll know their fruits, you'll, by their fruits you shall know them. So what a person produces or does shows what they are. Amen. Go ahead. That means everyone's producing fruit. That's right. Everyone. Good or bad, good or evil, yeah. See, neither sin nor righteousness is committed randomly or without cause. It all comes from something. You're capable of producing both kinds of fruit because you have two kinds of natures. Your job was to subdue the evil tree. That's within you. Your job is stop that thing from growing fruit. Amen. How do you do it? Crucify it. Amen. And the new man said, you, you feed, nourish, get, because they'll, there's certain fruit it'll produce. It's a good tree. New man's a good tree. Brother yes. That's why no one is excused from bearing good fruit because they're currently bearing bad fruit. Yes. Amen. Good. <laughs> 
And it's good. They know this. If they continue to bear bad fruit, the tree cut down. Now, because fruit reveals what you are, there are some sins that were like judged immediately, right, right on the spot. You've got Adam and Eve. You've Uzzah stay in the ark. Remember, put it in the ark. He was killed immediately. By God, you got Ananias and Sapphira. See, you got to keep this evil fruit comes, corrupt fruit comes from a corrupt tree. Keep that in mind is why these judgments yeah. happened. And you've got Herod, who didn't give God the glory. Yeah. And they said it was the voice of a God. He got puffed up, thought he was something, so the angel just struck him dead right there. Yeah. Other expressions. They were, God responded to them immediately because, see, they were expressions of the person. You've got uh, Abel's offering was received when, when it was offered because it came, came from him. You've got uh, Noah's ark. He built an ark to the saving of his house. See, this, this was a, his heart was in this work. You have Abraham, he believed God, and God imputed to him for righteousness. See? He, he didn't refuse to offer his son Isaac. He said, I'll bless your seed because you obeyed my voice. See, all this, these instant type responses are because they came from the real person. They weren't just like an accidental act that was, or a sporadic act that was committed. And other people, they were lauded immediately upon doing something because it was, it was good fruit coming from a good tree, see? For instance, the woman that anointed Jesus with the costly perfume, he immediately says, uh, she did this to anoint my body for burial, and wherever the gospel's preached, this will make all my mention of her. So immediately he responds to it. And then there was the woman with the two mites, remember, cast him in, immediately, oh, behold, she's cast in more than they all. Why did he say that? How? It's because this came from her heart. This was really her that was doing this. It was not an act. Now, Paul argues for the ministry of the Holy Spirit that worry is not quenched or grieved, certain things happen. They are recognized always in heaven. The fruit of the Spirit. Now at this point, the different versions throw up this big cloud again. Actually, most of the versions read fruit of light. My common ones, the New American Standard, the American Standard, the NIV, the New American, New Revised Standard Version, they all say light instead of spirit. Interesting, isn't it? How's, how does it sound? Well, I'm going to show you that it's not right. <clears throat> Versions that say fruit of light include the American Standard, the New American Standard, the New International, the Revised Standard, New Revised Standard, Darby's, English Revised, and a whole parcel of others. Read light, the fruit of light. Now, in the account of creation, light was created. Let there be light. I'm going to make a point here. I'm going to show that doctrinally this is incorrect, no matter how many Greek manuscripts support it. Later Greek manuscripts, they tell us, and all we've got is their word on this, say that light is the proper word, not spirit. All right, in the creation... God created light. Let there be light. However, light is never said to have brought forth anything. It's true at the command of God, the waters brought forth all kind of fish and all kind of birds. That's, that's, that's stated in Scripture. At God's command. God's command, the land brought forth all kind of living creatures. It says, but it never says the light brought forth something. Excluding God himself, who is light, God is light, light is not a cause, 
it's an effect. Now this uh, this is a very technical point, but it's, this has got to be seen. It's not light isn't what bears the fruit. Light, in fact, itself is a fruit, so to speak. <laughs> in accounting for the new principle of life, in other words, in other words, let me say this: light itself is never said to create anything in us. The change that takes place in us, or the work, is done by the Spirit. It's done by a person. Amen. Amen. That, that's the point. It's God that works all in all. See, that's a statement of Scripture. <laughs> Are you not counting for the new principle of life within us? The Spirit speak of the law of the Spirit of life. Again, it is the Spirit that gives life. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Eternal life, which is the ultimate fruit, we are told, will be reaped of or by the Spirit. Amen. Galatians 6, 8. So therefore I reject these other translations that say the fruit of light. Even in the case of spiritual illumination, it's the result of the Lord who opens the eyes of the understanding. Amen. So technically speaking, what has worked in us is not traced back to experience, but to God himself, who works in us both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. See, this, so this is doctrine, and this is, this is stated. You're talking about what's being worked in us. Is doctrine made pretty clear. The Spirit is the one that changes and works in us, and God works in us to will and do of his own good pleasure. See, it's a, it's a person of deity working in us that affects a change. Not light. Yes. In what sense then does the Spirit use the word, the phrase, children of light? They are children that are characterized by light, Amen. rather than being begotten of light. That's how I understand it. Apostle John says we are begotten of God. He yeah. specifically says. In the case, children of light. In this case, would. If God is light in that in that sense, it would be it would be begotten of yeah, and that it, it, in the sense that God is light. Yeah, when Jesus said He was the light of the world, and He said that we are light, but that's because we are yeah. in Him. Yeah. And uh, there's another reference there I had that the if to to walk in the light as He is in the yeah. light. See, it has to do with, with, with uh, the change in us is, is because we are reflecting His presence and His work. Yeah. That's God is light. So, so as we've been begotten by Him, yeah. then, then that light is in us. But still, <clears throat> light, to use this expression, uh, that that's a fruit of light, it like removes us when yeah. we're talking about the, the personal work of God. Jesus brought us to God, not to an intermediate yeah. position there. And and this gives an insinuation that somehow light itself is the operational yeah. force instead of the effect of God yeah. himself in the person of the Spirit. Amen. Uh, I want to say something more about what Aaron said. If any of you have any input on this, you don't hesitate to speak up. Aaron said in Corinthians 4, 6, he accounts for salvation by saying, God, command, God who commanded the light to shine has shined into our hearts. That would be children of light. Yes. Well, John says that Jesus is the true light which coming into the world enlightens every day. That'd be children of light. Right. Yes. That'd be children of light. See? So, in that, in this, so that, let me be more specific. The fruit of of Ephesians five is not the product of the light, but of who causes the light. Anyone else? Everything to you want to say? Another Go ahead. word that I that I thought about when you said that about light not producing anything is whatsoever is light doth make manifest. So the I thought of the fruit of the light is making manifest. 
Okay, we can manifest, make it manifest doesn't produce anything, it reveals something that's there. So, but I see what you're saying, it, yes. It would produce, I guess from my, I was thinking it would produce understanding. Yeah. Well, if you use light but, as a metaphor for understanding, then, then the, yeah. you, you would be like an environment where the Spirit would work. Yeah. But the, but the, the, the very light itself is something that the Holy Spirit yeah, yeah. produced in the person. Yeah, I would, I would, call light the environment of understanding rather than understanding itself. He said that God would give you the God would give you the spirit of wisdom and of understanding. See? God would open the eyes of your understanding. So I would I would take that not to be the what produces the understanding, but the environment. It's kind of technical, but yeah. some religious philosophies, you know, teach use this word light and throw it around a lot. Yeah. Some kind of impersonal force yeah. type thing. But the revelation of God is telling us it's not impersonal, it's personal. Yeah. And light is an instrument that God uses. Yeah. It certainly is. But it has no power of itself. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah it's, it's a difficult thing to, well, it, it, to explain, but I, we have to devote some attention to doing it. Mm-hmm. That the, the power behind it is the person of God. That's right. Yes. That's right. As compared yes. to what God did. Yes. Now there is a case, as I said, where he commanded the waters to bring forth, he commanded the light land to bring forth, but the light didn't bring forth the the bodies, the celestial bodies, for instance. They weren't produced by the light. Well again, just a little word about how I was surprised to see so many what we call leading versions will translate that. Yeah, it was too. I, I wasn't aware of that. That's a subtle, yeah, that's, that's a subtle departure yeah. from uh, mm -hmm. from the God who does yeah. all things. It says God works in you. That that's, the uh -huh. Spirit works in you. Jesus, but I don't know that it ever says understanding works in you or illumination works in you. It is the work. It, yeah. It is the work. It doesn't do the work, as I, under, I understand it, in the sense of this text. Yes? You know, Jesus said that whenever he left, when he went back to the Father, he would send the Comforter. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, I'll give you, or, you know, I'll send some light to you. Yeah. Because the same things that were said to the to believers were heard by unbelievers. Yeah. So the revelation was there. But so was the blindness to some. The opening of the eyes to, to, to be able to behold what is revealed still is the operation of God in mm -hmm. the believer by faith that he ministers yeah. to us. And so that uh, light in and of itself, I mean, we can, we can see uh, in the physical world the example of this. It can be bright daylight, but if you're blind, it doesn't do a thing for you. Mm -hmm. There's got to be something further than just the presence of light. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. So these translators then are the ones that have changed this. I mean, the, the word is pneuma. In Greek, it's the yeah. word that's translated spirit. There are some, Every other place, yeah. spirit or ghost. There are some Greek manuscripts yeah. that have the word for light. Really? Yeah. Now, uh, what what prompted a person to choose these? That's that's the yes. thing that interests me. Yeah. Well, they're, they're playing off the phrase at the end of verse eight, aren't they? Walk as children of light. Yes, they are. They are. Yeah. Yes, they so are. Connecting that to that. that they're yeah, doing. there are. But there are some ancient translations. Well, they're not so ancient, but there are trans versions, Greek manuscripts that do the word, use the word for light. Yeah. Now, if we're to let our light so shine, right, that they may see your good works and yeah. glorify your Father. Now that, 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 that produces an effect, but see, your light cannot, uh, cannot ignite a light in somebody else. God has to light their candle. God has to be mm -hmm. the one to actually ignite that. Yeah. But they can see your good works. I mean, your light can be, yeah. can be shown, can be seen, but that, that in itself isn't what produces life yeah. in another person. Yeah, that would, I would limit my comments to what we're commenting on is this verse here. Okay. What what all light can do, uh -huh. 
you could build some cases about this, what all light can do. But in this text here, you talk about the fruit. I'm saying that I don't think that this is what light does. It's what the person of the Spirit does. John made an affirmation that is, that is a very akin to the spirit of this text when he said, He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Yeah. So, yeah. so the fruit produced is traced back to the God who gave the light. That's right. Yeah, it's good to talk about these things, though. Yeah. Very good. That it shows you that fine distinctions are made in the Word of God when it, when you trace back to what made it happen. Mm -hmm. It generally goes back to God, Christ, or the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ult ultimately, goes back. Now, they may use other th they use other things. I understand this. Certainly uses it. There's an instrumentality. That's so, right. But he's the source. He's the source. And I think that's what he's emphasizing here is the ultimate source. <coughs> and in the fruit of the Spirit in, that is, this is like the, the room or the environment in which the Spirit does his work. Yeah. And he's going to create... He's going to, what he's going to mention is not deeds. He's going to mention characteristics of the deeds. Now, just one more thing before we move on. Jesus declared that there was none good but God. And yeah. righteousness, the, the righteousness that we're talking about in Scripture is the righteousness of God. That's good. And that is particularly tied to this term, yeah, fruit of. Very good. Yeah. So yeah. It, it has to, yeah. by merit of righteousness and goodness, go back to yeah. the Father. There Amen. can't be something else that produces this. Amen. And then you could, a person could also argue that light is never distinguished from God. It's not separated from Him. In fact, the light of this children of light, that's connected directly to God. Light doesn't stand as a spiritual entity of itself. The Father of light. Father of lights. In, so this, well, this word is first, it is, that is, the fruit of the Spirit is, I mean, these are things that exist. These are not goals. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about a, a target, an aim, something to shoot for. He's talking about something that, that exists. It exists. It is. Already is. Just like God is. It exists in every kind of thing we're going to talk about. Every, every kind of manifestation of it. The first is goodness. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness. Other versions read that is good. Some read righteous or complete goodness. Kindly goodness. And the word goodness means uprightness of heart and soul. It says there's, it's, there's no mitigating influence of selfishness or pride or covetousness or anything like that in this at all. It's, it's moral, moral excellence. Moral excellence is, is, a, is by choice. It's, it's the, person, the goodness is a matter of preference and choice. It's, char it's not characterized. Goodness is something that's, that's not rotten in any. It's a fruit that's not a fruit of the Spirit. Is in or is characterized by goodness. There's no flaw in it. There's no rottenness in it. There's nothing in it that will deteriorate with time. There's nothing in it that will grow obsolete after a while. It's thoroughly good of good and excellent quality. The idea of generosity is, is in that and of being kind that is disposed to 
be kind without any kind of ignoble purpose, like what I can get from this or how they'll respond. Or None of that is in this. It's thoroughly good. Any word or deed that in any way contradicts goodness, has any kind of flaw in it, is not from the Spirit. Goodness. Now when you read good work, see that? <laughs> It puts a little different, <laughs> little different light on it. See, Amen. righteousness. Righteousness, in a broad sense, is a state of him who, as he is, as he ought to be. He he measures up to God's standard of right. It's a condition that's acceptable to God, Amen. righteous. God Amen. receives it without, I mean, he doesn't receive it hesitatingly or receive it like at least the minimum requirement has been reached. It's not like that. It's received by God. What the person does is received by God and approved by him. Now, goodness has to do with expressing righteousness has to do with toward God. It says righteousness, this isn't something that men say, that's righteous. That's not the point of the text. It's God who says, that's righteous. It's men who can say, that's good. So goodness has to do with manward. Righteousness has to do with Godward. So that a person who is bearing the fruit of the Spirit, is moved to do good to men and to be right with God. Amen. Acceptable to Him. And in and the Scriptures you know, draw this out about God's acceptance, for instance. Let's, let's note a couple of texts here. One is Galatians 3.11. No man, that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, Yes, we're talking about righteousness is in the sight Amen. of God. It is evident for the just to live by faith. Again, it's written, if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. Amen. See, the only kind of righteousness that is accepted by God is the righteousness that comes from him. Amen. That's, right. That's the only one. The fruit of the Spirit now is in all goodness, all righteousness and all truth. Truth is what is real. Verity is a good, uh, good word. As God counts realness, some things that you see and can touch and handle are not real by God's definition. In other words, they, they're going to pass away. So something that's going to pass away is real from Earth's point of view. But from heaven's perspective, is anything temporal is not real. What is real from God's point of view is what will survive the demise of the world. That, now that's something that's truth. See, that's truth. The prophet said it either can be shaken or it can't that's be right. shaken. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yes, that's right. Truth. Now, God is declared to be a God of truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. The Spirit is called the Spirit of truth. So here you have the whole Godhead connected with reality. Amen. So anything God talks about is not a parable. Jesus spoke in parables when he was on earth. When he went back to heaven, he said, no more parables. Yeah. Mm, no more. Go talk about things that are. So eternal life's not a parable. Amen. Yeah. An eternal inheritance is not a figure of speech. It's, it's real. It's not the crown of righteousness, the crown of life. See, these are real things characterized by what really is. Mm -hmm. And the, the gospel is called the word of truth. See? So it's it's, it's not holding out before men figmentary goals 
It's holding out before man something that really is. Jesus really did die. Jesus really did take the sin of the world away. Jesus really did plunge his principalities and powers. He really destroyed the devil. He's really at the right hand of God. He's really making an intercession for us. It's all real from God's yes. point of view. The fact that the fruit of the Spirit is so characterized is a strong argument for walking as children of light. You walk as children of light when you are in the, you are walking in an awareness of these eternal verities that are associated with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit in the Gospel. You live in view of those things. Now, as you know, that uh, it's not as simplistic as it may sound. This requires fight and they keep Fight faith, you have to fight the good fight of faith, you have to fight to maintain it. You have to resist the devil to maintain it. You have to seek the things that are above to maintain it. So it's it's not a simplistic thing at all. But when you walk as children of light, you're walking in the full recognition of these realities that are proclaimed by God, in God, Christ, Spirit, and the gospel. That's a marvelous truth, isn't it? See, this is why the gospel has got to be preached to the church yeah. as well as to everybody else. Because yeah. it's setting before the people the realities that in which they have to maintain their lives. Mm -hmm. They have to live in view of the intercession of Christ and the soon coming of Christ and the sovereignty of God and the rulership of Jesus. So they have to live their lives with that, with that in their awareness, being acutely conscious of those things. Amen. Well, otherwise you can't walk as children of life. Amen. Now, as we have described in this read, read first, goodness, righteousness, truth, this describes the nature of the fruit. Now, in Galatians, the fifth chapter, he, he itemizes, he points out some details of the fruit itself. Not its nature, but what the fruit actually consists of. And there it is. It consists of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. See, that's, that's the details of the fruit itself. Fruit singular. Mm -hmm. If you were to take an orange... You'd have an epidermis, the skin around it. Mm -hmm. You have the pulpy substance. You got the orange part itself you eat. You got the seeds. It's one fruit, but it's comprised of a lot of different things. You got an apple, you got a stem, you know, and you got a core, and you got the epidermis again, you got the pulp, and but it's all one fruit, but it consists of many things. That's the fruit, not fruits. Mm -hmm. Some modern versions do say fruits. It's fruit. Amen. And all of the fruit of the Spirit, that is all the different components of it, are all characterized by goodness, righteousness, and truth. Amen. Amen. Every single part of in your own personal uh, study and this sort of thing, this is very, uh, very helpful to keep this in mind. That every single thing the Spirit leads a person to do will be characterized by goodness, righteousness, and, and truth. Amen. Now verse 10 says, Proving what is acceptable to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now there's an underlying objective uh, in all teaching and preaching. The objective is not change in men. That's, not, that's included, but it's, that's not the objective. Ult ultimate objective or the betterment of the world. That's not. It has to do with God being justified in all of his sayings. The ultimate objective is when the day of judgment comes, every single syllable God ever reveals will be shown to be absolutely true. And anyone that contradicted it, contradicted it was a liar. Let God be Amen. true and every man a liar. He might be justified in all his sayings and overcome when he's judged. See, that's the ultimate purpose is to prove God is what he said he is. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that. No, everybody doesn't know that. 
evidence are that even angelic spirits, they don't doubt this. They don't doubt, but they've never seen a demonstration of some of God's traits until Jesus came along. There were some of God's traits they've never seen in exhibit of them. God's love, God's mercy, God's grace. They had never been exhibited before. And I, who knows, after we get the glory, there may be other innumerable parts of God that will be made known and at, at that time also. God is shown to be faithful. See, that's something that God's demonstrating. He's faithful. Man's not faithful until he's in Christ, but God's faithful. Amen. Whether it's in a curse or a blessing, whichever, whichever one, God is faithful. And he, he wants his, his uh, name to be known. He wants to be noted for who he is. Now he's chosen to do this in three primary ways, to make known who he is. First, he made these things known completely through his son. He was the exhibit of God manifest in the flesh. Second, he's doing so through the gospel, proclamation of the gospel of Christ. That's revealing aspects of God hitherto not expounded and seen. And third, he's, he's accomplishing it through his people before the eyes of those on earth and those in heaven. So these are the ways God's exhibiting, he's revealing what he's like. He's always, he has never changed, what he is has never changed. Yeah. There's never ever been added to God's person or character. He's always been what he is now. But when Jesus came, he made this known. Then when the gospel was preached and expounded, it unfolded what God is like. And as God's people do not quench and grieve the Spirit, through them it's being made known what God is like. Isn't that good? <laughs> and they, all these work harmoniously. Right? Harmoniously. Now the word proving, in other words, other versions read finding out, trying to learn, find out, try to learn, test by experience, try to determine, discerning, try to discover, distinguishing, figure out, try to learn in your experience. See, it's a hard thing to, evidently, for some of them to express. It's another way of saying you should be dissatisfied if you don't understand God and what God's doing. There's a kind of should be a spirit of dissatisfaction. Even if even if you're unable to know, you should have a driving compulsion to know. Then I'll know as I'm known. You, know, you, you want to look forward to the time when you can. You're discontent yeah. with being ignorant. So he's telling you a way now to find out what is acceptable to God. How do you know that? The lexical meaning of proving is Test, examine, prove, scrutinize to see whether a thing is genuine or not. Recognize as genuine after examination to approve, deem worthy. So how does a person prove or test or determine what's acceptable to God? Well, someone says, I'll read the Bible. Well, that isn't what he says. That doesn't mean don't read the Bible. <laughs> You see, it's assumed in Scripture that you are exposing yourself to the Word of God because man lives by the Word of God. So that's, a taken, that's something that's taken for granted in the kingdom of God. But he's going to tell you how you, how you prove or find out. How do you finally find out? It's by doing what God says to do. That's the answer to this. That's how you find out whether this stuff is real or not. Yeah. If God makes a, if God says, walk in the Spirit, mm -hmm. and you start walking in the Spirit, then, then God shows you, that's what I approve of. Mm -hmm. You present your body a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service, and that then you approve what's the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So. It's in this state of living by faith, walking in the Spirit, 
being obedient in other various ways that kind of light was expressed, walking in the light, it's as you do this that it's unfolded to you what God accepts. Amen. Mm -hmm. Other people just guess at it. He can only guess. That's how God protects this thing, see? Yeah. It's like Abraham didn't know where he was going till he got started. Yeah. Then on the way, it was made known to him where he was going. That's the same thing with you. As you involve yourself in doing of the will of God, according to your understanding, you're, you're growing in this, understanding you're growing in this, but as you grow, your understanding of what's acceptable, it grows too. And as you, and this is what keeps you from going back into the flesh. Yeah. Amen. When you know what's acceptable to God, this is not just like you know your mathematical tables. It's not that kind of no. It's that you've walked in a state of acceptance and you have this assurance of faith. You, you have it. And when you have that, that causes the world to lose its to lose its luster. Yeah. Amen. When you live in the power of God, the yeah, world right. has no power over you. That's right. It's only by His power that we do any of these things it, anyway. It's, it's God that is at work within us, both the will and the do. That's right. His good pleasure. It's a sin. When you see it, it seems simple. But then as you ponder it, it's really not so simple. Yeah. Yes. When you come into this kind of understanding, you really can't explain this to someone that doesn't have it themselves. You... You can say, I know whom I believe. Amen. <clears throat> it's, well, how do you know? I don't know. How can you know? See, they don't. They can't see it. Why? Amen. Because they're not involved uh -huh. in the doing of the will of God. Yeah, there are evidences that are experienced by the person. That's right. I mean, because these things are internal. That, I mean, there are certain things that can't be seen. Like, how do you see fellowship? Yeah. How do you see cleanness of conscience? That's right. How do you see, you know, now they can see the, the outworking of it, the fact that you do have the ability, uh, in, in fact, you, you operate within the confines of that ability to refuse what is evil and to, to prefer what is good mm -hmm. and to be bold in, in certain things and to be confident in the word. Mm -hmm. They, those things can be seen, but there are certain things, I mean, they can't see what has provoked it. They have to believe it like That's you right. have to believe it. Amen. Now, many of you, if many of you have experienced this, haven't you? You've actually experienced this. That as you've lived under the Lord, then this confidence level comes up, see? And you're more fully assured, because it's hard to live godly when you're not sure whether God has accepted you or not. And we're not simple. We know that it is possible to be in Christ and not really know you're in there. But, but it's, not, it's not possible to remain in that state and be accepted by God. Eventually, you have to come to the point where you're assured and you recognize this is, this is good. What I'm experiencing and doing is good. And righteous, mm -hmm. and true, mm -hmm. and, and your confidence is built so you you're able to go out and face Goliath, see, because yes. you know you pro he he proved God's faithfulness to him when he was in the sheep coat, yeah. right? Kill that lion and bear. Yeah. So as he took the as he took his stewardship seriously, his confidence built, and then he could face Goliath. Now, some of you, uh, some of our families went through that tornado and, and lost most of what they had. But they, they had a remarkable reaction to it all. They kept, why did they? Why did they? Because they'd been walking in the light. Yeah, they'd been living up, see, to the measure of knowledge they'd received. So when this extraordinary trial came, they were ready for it. They had already proved what's the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, right. and so they were able to pass through it without being thrown down by it. Yeah, Apparently right. some people were just crushed. Yeah, oh, they yes. lost everything. They were just totally crushed. Yes, they were. They're still trying to recover. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Psychologically, they emotionally, and so forth. Yeah, they, see, they didn't have this. Yeah. So this, this 
from a practical point of view, this is the only way to live. From a practical point of view. Go ahead, Brother Tony. It's the kind of knowledge that calls salt for the, the believers. That's right. They walk, in, uh, they walk in acceptable before God. That's right. Awareness. Acceptable with God. The word acceptable, acceptable means well-pleasing. That is, it isn't like just barely accepted. The English word acceptable means, one meaning is, barely satisfactory or adequate. Well, we will we'll accept that. This is not what acceptable means here. Acceptable means here no reservation. It's not met the bare requirements. That's not what it's talking about. Abel's offering was acceptable. There was nothing about it that was not acceptable. Cain's offering wasn't acceptable. There's nothing about it that was. See? It's, it's, it's a different kind of a word. The scriptures declare. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things, righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit, serveth Christ is acceptable. Here it is. See, there it is. Righteousness, peace, what you are, righteousness, Peace, what you have. Joy, what you express. If you have these, you're acceptable. But you know you're acceptable because, because you have them. See, yeah. because, you're walk, because you're walking in those things. Paul said, He continued ministering the gospel of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable. So he kept on preaching, even after they were in, he kept on preaching the gospel. Amen. So that the Gentiles would be acceptable. See, we're never to assume that what we've offered to God has been accepted. But we can't assume that. That's got to be known. God said enough about this subject, it can be known. It can be known. It's not by thinking on what you've offered, it's thinking on how you offered it. See, if God was the sole purpose behind it, you did it because to please God, you, no selfish motive, you didn't give him something so you could get something, see? Babylon just assumes that because you're part of Babylon, anything you That's say right. is acceptable to God. That's right. Just because you're part of the group. They'll have, and they preach that way and they talk to people that way. And they'll way. have routines you can yep. go through. Weekly routines that if you, if you do this, it'll guarantee your acceptance. Yes. In summary, proving the proving the what's acceptable in summation is putting off the old man, putting on the new man. That kind of sums the whole thing up. And when you do that, and this is an ongoing process, in your conscience, you develop an awareness of what's acceptable to God, and when it, you've found it, you're acceptable to God. The impact that this knowledge has upon your life and how you live it and what you do and the friends you make and all this sort of thing is incalculable. You can't estimate the potency of understanding this, being able to say, I know whom I believed. I'm persuaded he's able to keep what I've committed unto him against or up until that day as a day of judgment. That's what we want for everyone. And everyone who's in Christ can have this. This isn't like for the an elite number. This is for everyone who's in Christ can have this. And it, you will find also it will directly it will directly bear on your role in the body of Christ. You'll have a direct bearing on what you're doing in the body of Christ, where He's placed you. I think I'll close there. I trusted I didn't confuse anything for you here. This is a, it's a marvelous text of scripture, but I tell you there's a there's a depth a depth to this text that I want to do a little more digging. <laughs> a little more digging and probing. 
because it there's no ambiguity in it. it it's all straightforward affirmation, see, so there's no there's no wiggle room, so to speak, in these. So this tells you that the magnitude of what we're talking about, that if you can get hold of this, it'll make you stable. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. With Mike? Oh. We would like to hear from you anyway if you got a thing to say. <laughs> Anyone tonight have anything else? Oh, yes, but This is the sense in which the Apostle Paul said, lay hold on eternal life. Yeah, that's Amen. good. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, that walk, walking as children of light, you, you're never going to find yourself in a more acceptable or perfect, in the, in the acceptable, perfect will of God. Than, another way of saying it, walk in the Spirit. It, you're, you're, that is the place that God's pleased where you walk. Yeah, that's right. Anyone else? Yes, sir. No, I was sir. thinking about uh, the lessons in Genesis how we've seen how different ones have went against different brethren and things yeah. that they did, but they were proving what is acceptable. That's right. Exactly what they That's were doing right. as they grew in their faith. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes, Sister Brother. Being able to prove what is acceptable, the key there is that last phrase is unto God. Unto God, that's right. Because God cannot accept anything that is unlike Himself. Very good. And so right. when we know God, His nature, then what what we offer to Him, we can be confident that it's acceptable as long as it is like Him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. And another way of looking at that is that if it's the fruit of the Spirit that's being manifested in you or being born in you, as the Spirit abides mm -hmm. in you, if this is guaranteed, then you know you have a guarantee that the Lord's going to accept it because the Holy Spirit yeah. brought it forth. It's a fruit yeah. of the Spirit, which the, but the Father's never going to disregard anything yeah. of the Spirit. The Holy does. Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That's good. Yes. And in the beginning of your, your lesson, one of the, the points that you made was how God uh, manifests Himself. And the last one was through his through his people. Mm -hmm. Now, improving what is acceptable to the Lord is actually a manifestation of God Himself. That's good. Amen. It is it is the person of God uh, as as we're brought into His nature. We're partakers of His nature, so that nature then is expressed where it can be seen of men and of, of heavenly creatures that that are beholding these things. They're, it actually is, Jesus was the preeminent one, God in the flesh. Well, in our measure, and as yeah. we grow in faith, Amen. we are of God in the flesh. Amen. We're, we're showing forth His nature and His person. Life of Christ manifests in our mortal body. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, Brother Aaron? Among men, the, the word uh, prove is often thought of and used in just in the context of, uh, of an argument. <laughs> right. Pro like prove you wrong or prove me yeah. right. But in this case, it's more about authenticity. Amen. Amen. That's good. All right. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the way you have expressed things in your word. We thank you for it. It's challenging qualities and how that when we enter into it it has a confirming ministry to us we pray you would evermore give us this bread in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Amen.